So here's another episode where I look at rare books and the rare book market. Now, as you can see, of course, from my short sleeves and the inappropriate blinding lights for camera in the background there, I am in Southern California, but I am on my way to New York City for the New York Antiquarian Book Fair next week. So I hope everyone will visit me there who possibly can. I'm going to be in booth uh, C6. I hope that's my booth. Otherwise, I'm going to be looking at somebody else's books. And I'll put a link to our catalog uh, below. So if you want to peruse it for, say, like 12 or 15 hours of your leisure time, go ahead. The link is there. Now, I also wanted to talk perhaps for a little shorter time on this video, maybe seven or eight minutes. I'll see if I accomplish that because I certainly can babble on. Because I noticed at the 15 minute mark or so, or at least when I do those videos, about after seven minutes or so, people start to trail off. So those people who had nine or 10 hours sleep last night and uh, think that they could use a little bit more from my, after seeing my videos, I'd like to keep you engaged all the way till the end. Now, the topic I am going to talk about on this video is going to be on valuing a rare book. Now, I've talked about that a few times before, but people always ask me to make more on that specific and important topic. And I've chosen this time a rather sophisticated little book. Now, sophisticated, of course, like fine wine and cheese, this requires some appreciation of rare books. Uh, so it's not for the total beginner, I would say. But I don't mean that in a pompous way, of course, because these are the type of things that are not immediately and obviously valuable. Like if you came across a first edition of The Hobbit that was signed by Tolkien that everybody is familiar with. So these are actually the things you can find at reasonable prices, sometimes rarities, and make money on. Now, the thing I'm holding in my hand is the, the Constitution, a state of Mississippi printed in Washington in 1832. Now, what immediately appealed to me, and again, in that sophisticated sense, is its aesthetic value here, because this is a wonderful looking little tract. It has its original string here. It's got a beautiful, uh, simple border, but it has the American Eagle as well. And I wasn't uh, particularly familiar uh, with the Constitution of 1832 in Mississippi. But I knew enough and had enough instinct to realize that this little charming and beautiful pamphlet could be rare, and certainly it required a more careful examination. Now, one of the things that's very important that I do is I actually read the old books, because I'm looking for you know, tidbits and information on which I can create an important story and set it in its historical context. And one of the first things I noticed here was the provision on slaves, which is particularly interesting because it actually forbids the importation of slaves into Mississippi in 1832, which is, uh, at least to me, uh, an unusual provision. But at the same time, it takes that double-edged sword approach, and it actually forbids as well their emancipation if they're already in the territory. So that's quite fascinating. Another aspect of this pamphlet, or at least this constitution, is that in 1832, they had an elected judiciary in Mississippi, which uh, is obviously an important part of our government and somewhat taken for granted today, but it was novel for the time, and Mississippi was actually one of the first states to have an elected judiciary. And finally, the section on Native Americans is quite interesting because, of course, a large part of Mississippi was reserved for white settlers, but they had a sizable population of Native Americans, and it actually gives a path forward in the Constitution for American citizenship for the Native Americans. Uh, see how generous uh, they were in Mississippi uh, during that period. Uh, now, how do I go about valuing a tract like this that I instinctually feel might be valuable? Well, I run right away to rarebookhub.com, which is a commonly used database of auction prices, which I've talked about before. And when you type in Constitution, State of Mississippi, 1832, Boom! Pops up a record right away from a few years ago at Sotheby's, where they sold a copy for $6,000, emphasizing its rarity. However, interestingly, that was not this copy. That was also a copy printed in 1832 by Peter uh, Isler, Isler in Jackson, uh, in Mississippi. And they stated that that was the first edition of the Second Mississippi Constitution. 
And immediately I was slightly disappointed. Well, maybe this is a later imprint, I'm not sure. But when I started examining the printer, Andrew Marshall, he was actually the first printer in Mississippi. So I started to question the priority, which one is actually the first true edition of the second important Mississippi Constitution. And that's a very intriguing bibliographical question that sometimes cannot even be answered. Because if you look in bibliographies, it's not always clear which tract was printed first. But it can be a point of great importance because, of course, naturally, everybody wants the first uh, printing of something. And that really can uh, enhance or detract uh, from the value of something. Uh, now, I had to delve a little bit deeper into the Rare Book Hub database, and sure enough, this is quite a rarity, and you don't really find any records until you go back to the 1960s, and you find the firm of Eberstadt's records in that database, which thankfully they have incorporated because they are very valuable records. Eberstadt was a leading Americana dealer. He originally was a gold miner out west, but then I think in about 1907 or so, he went back east and really found gold in the rare book trade and become, became one of the leading Americana dealers, especially of Western Americana, and had an enviable stock of great American rarities. And I really trust his uh, description. I also have a friend, Michael Vinson, who wrote a wonderful book on the firm of Edward Eberstadt. So if you want to go on Amazon and look up Michael Vinson's book on Eberstadt, it's a great read. And if that shoots to number one bestseller on Amazon, especially in the category of uh, you know, American bookseller uh, uh, biographies, well then, Michael, you better thank me. And of course, you might even be interested in this track, so reach out to me. Now, when I examine those Eberstadt records, it's very, very curious because in, 19, in the 1960s, he had a copy of this, and he stated that it's not even in Owens, which is the bibliography of Mississippi imprints. And he valued this particular tract at $850, which was a lot of money uh, in the 1960s. And you could have put that into NVIDIA long before NVIDIA even existed and made a fortune. Curiously, as a point of relative pricing, he also had a copy of the very one that sold printed in Jackson that Sotheby's sold for $6,000. And he valued that at $650, so $200 less then he valued this more valuable imprint at. So that's uh, quite curious to somebody who's trying to value things uh, in the rare book trade. Uh, as I said, and when I compare the aesthetics of the two volumes, the one at Sotheby's with this charming volume, I actually find this one much more pleasing because it has the outer wrapper with this beautiful border and American Eagle. So I really became excited about this track, not only for its content, its rarity, but of course as a bookseller uh, because of its potential price. Now the question is, to whom do I sell something like that? Because that is, of course, an important part of the art of bookselling. Now naturally, when I think about that, there are people who are interested in American law, so that's always a possibility. There's Secondly, institutions in Mississippi, and I haven't checked all their holdings yet, that certainly would be interested in an early Mississippi imprint like this of you know, considerable uh, importance. There are people who are interested in you know, founding over the Republic uh, documents, and I think this really makes a case uh, for those type of people because, again, uh, it is one of the earliest elected judiciaries. But I think, at least for me, the larger market is going to be in institutions or collectors that are interested in the history and development of slavery uh, in America, as well as Native American rights, because both of those are addressed on an early and fundamental level, at least on the state level, in this rather unusual 1832 Constitution. So as I said, this is a rather sophisticated uh, book, but... It is something that uh, required some research. It still requires some additional research, but it has a lot of potential, uh, at least for making money, but also scholarly potential, historical potential to uh, interest you know, collectors and libraries. So I hope you like this video, and I certainly hope uh, you will subscribe. And as I said, I hope you will push Michael's book on the firm of Edward Eberstadt to number one on Amazon. So thank you so much for watching.